workshops and speakers talk about topics like ETs, human origins, and the secret space program. Corey Good made some big announcements at this event, including him and his team working on a comic book, a TV show, and some other things as well. After this event, some people in the community were triggered and wondering about his motives behind these projects. So, without further ado, we're gonna give Corey a chance to respond to these allegations. He came to me about three weeks ago and really wanted a chance to go over these allegations and wanted to do this through my channel. I obliged and we did an interview last week. So this took us over four hours to go through the allegations and talk about them. And I did want to mention that I had a lot of people contact me with viewer questions. So we were not able to go through all of your view viewer questions like we wanted to. And I wanted to make a quick note that we will be doing extra sessions between Corey and I so we can talk about more Q&A and things like that. So first of all, thank you so much for submitting your questions and we will get to those here in the future as well. So I hope you guys enjoy the interview. Also, if you would like to enjoy more exclusive content from me, feel free to go over to my Patreon and subscribe there. Bye. Hi, this is Teresa at Divine Frequency <laughs> and we've got Corey Good here with us. Hello. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. So I'm going to do a quick intro about you so that the viewers know who you are. For those who don't know Corey Good, at the age of six, he was inducted into the military abduction program. He was identified as an intuitive empath. And he was part of this program until he was 17. Mm -hmm. And then he was taken into the secret space program where he was a part of what's called the 20 and back where you go out into the space program. He talks about bases on the moon and Mars, all kinds of information, brings it back. He did this program three times. And what I mean by that is that when you come back from the 20 and back, you are age regressed and time regressed. So you come back to when you were 17, this happened three times. So he served 60 years in the secret space program, came back as a 17 year old, lived the rest of his life and met his wife and has kids and then around, a certain point, I don't know when, maybe 2012, 2013, started connecting to people online through a pseudonym and then at some point came out into the public eye around 2015. He has a show on Gaia TV called Cosmic Disclosure where he talks about all of these experiences that he had off planet and even in the inner earth, all kinds of stuff. Cool, cool stuff. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Absolutely. So today in particular, we are going to talk about some of the recent things that have happened. So. We all went to cause or contact in the desert uh, a couple, when was that? A month ago, which was end of May, June, early June. Yes. Yeah. 2017. And you made some big announcements there. Can you tell us a little bit about the announcements that you made? Yeah, we, we made a number of them. Um, one of them is that uh, we're doing a book, a joint book. Uh, it's called The Case for a Secret Space Program. It's actually the same title as the MUFON Symposium this year. In the book, Dr. Sala, Dr. Woods, William Tompkins, and I are going to uh, write a book together. And uh, just recently, Jay Widener agreed to do a forward, and David Wilcock also has agreed to do a forward. So there are going to be two forwards for the book by uh, David and Jay. They have both vetted me and Tompkins. So that's really good to have their input. That's very exciting. That's yeah. super exciting news. But of course, we did talk about, uh, you know, we're working with trying to get a uh, series on Netflix mm -hmm. similar to Stranger Things. Um, that's still moving along. It takes like a year and a half uh, to, to do that process. We're uh, working on a graphic novel as well. So, yeah, there's probably uh, projects. I forgot to mention so many going on. <laughs> That's so exciting. I was actually there when you made those announcements and everybody in the crowd was super excited. Yeah. And um, yeah, especially about the book. I thought that that is so important. And especially because when you go into a bookstore and you want to find information about the secret space program, it's really hard. You go into all the different sections on military history. You're not going to really find anything there. You can look in conspiracy and you really don't really find much. And I actually just went the other day to see if I could find anything and I didn't really see anything at all. <laughs> right, that's something I've been talking with Dr. Sala a lot about. Um, he wants to get this information into colleges. You know, that's his exopolitics. That's what he does. So that's how a lot of this book is being geared, not necessarily to, to sell just to the, like the UFO community. It's meant to be out there more mainstream. 
um, you know, the mandate I was given was to bring this stuff more commercially to get it out there and get it mainstream so that uh, the mass consciousness will pick up on it and start to demand the release of these technologies. That's a big part of this plan. We're all, we want to release these technologies. And uh, the best way to do it is for us to come together, uh, unify, but also through different projects uh, through the entertainment industry to help seed the mass consciousness. That must feel very empowering after all you've been through, tumbling through this experience of realizing what you've been through mm -hmm. and then connecting to how, how you sit now in the public eye and what that means for you. Yeah, it's empowering. Um, I, you know, I'm new to the public eye. So, you know, of course, I've made mistakes and I've learned from them. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, pretty, it's a pretty intimidating process. I can imagine. And so as you have really made these huge strides in your career and started to connect with these people that have been corroborating your story over the last couple of years, some you're going to experience a little bit of turmoil in the beginning as people are trying to figure out who you are and what you stand for. And so since you came out with these announcing these projects, it's seemed like in the last month or so, there have been a lot of people asking questions, really trying to understand you know, where you sit, where you come from, why you're here. And I yeah. thought that uh, this would be a good opportunity to ask you some questions. I know that you came to me a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago saying that you wanted to make some public statements. So I would love to help you do that. I know mm -hmm. that uh, there's been some controversies, but we can go ahead and move forward through that together. And I can. Right, you. right. And, uh, you know, I've spoken, you know, with, to, I speak to David Wilcock almost every day. And one of the things that he told me when I first started to get into this, I guess, business, if you want to call it, is that there are going to be haters, you're going to be attacked, never, never, never respond. And that's how he has done, and it's worked great for him. And I've tried to do the same. It's been very difficult. I, I can take all of the, the, the really slanderous stuff coming out about me, but I've gotten pretty triggered when stuff started coming out, you know, about you and Roger, you know, people that I know are very, uh, have very good intentions and, and want to make a difference in this world. And to see them slandered like that upset me very deeply. And, you know, we have spoken with attorneys and one of the attorneys that talked to people in our group stated that it was a good idea to make a public statement. You know, because there's a lot of people out there that they're sick of this. I'm sick of this. They don't want to hear about it anymore. I don't want to hear about it anymore. But there's a certain percentage of the people that believe not responding is an admission of guilt. And those people have began, begun to really jump on the bandwagon. So I'm here to set the record straight. Sounds good. Yes, I know that a few of us have made our, uh, most of us have made our public statements of people that were involved in. I know you've been busy with filming at Gaia TV and everything, so you're back now and we've had a chance finally to, to round up and do this. Yeah, so. I mean, when the attacks first occurred, it was, I was expecting them at Contact in the Desert. We, you know, we had been warned, but it really hit right after Contact in the Desert and we were in the middle of filming Cosmic Disclosure. We had all this stuff going on. We could not respond. They, it all happened at a time to where we just didn't have the time to respond. And uh, it, was, it was pretty crazy. When you say that you were warned at Contact in the Desert, what, can you talk a little bit more to that? For weeks before Contact in the Desert, people were contacting us, just like they were contacting Jimmy Church, and it was, the scuttlebutt was out there, that, we, that uh, Project Avalon was formulating this huge takedown plan and that they were going to execute it at Contact in the Desert. I was told that they were going to do like they do Trump, you know, stand up and heckling during his speeches, to uh, show up like paparazzi with video cameras in my face, asking me, you know, about different allegations. And, you know, I was hearing all of this and, uh, you know, it, you know, I was nervous. I had intrepidation. Um, told David, we told the people at Contact in the Desert, all the stuff that was, you know, being said, and they bumped up security. That's why David and I, we were going around with one to two security guards apiece because they were active threats. Did anything happen? No, no, but it was a pretty good psyop. I, I think that the people that were there, they were obviously there because they passed video and all this information back to uh, the attackers. Uh, I think they saw how much love was at this event 
You know, the organizers of Contact in the Desert do a great job. It's it's an awesome event. There's no place for, you know, hatred there. And uh, they knew that they would be drowned out. They would have been out of place. Yeah. It really would have been. <laughs> so, you know, I was, I had a lot of intrepidation during that trip. And of course, I was staying at the bed and breakfast as much as possible. Uh, we were, there were a few people that, you know, we didn't quite trust that we're trying to get into our inner circle that uh, we had, uh, we'd known that they'd been saying bad things about us and disparaging us. And then with us, they were acting like, oh, we're good friends, you know, and, and it just, you know, our senses, spidey senses were tingling big time. So we kept the people at arm's length and uh, those people ended up uh, getting upset. But uh, to explain of why, to explain why we were, so reserved and standoffish a contact in the desert, which was uncharacteristic. Usually we're mingling. Uh, it was because of all the threats that we told were, we were told were coming. And then they came later. They did. <laughs> <laughs> they did. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, to sit there, you know, I know you, you know me, me, and to hear some of the most slanderous lies, you know, talk you know, about people, especially like Roger, who's like, the nicest he, guy yeah, in the world. He's intimidating looking with these tattoos. He's a big grizzly bear looking guy, but he's the most gentle, sweet guy and loving spirit that you'll ever meet. And uh, uh, nothing like what they're trying to report him as. It's, 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 it's crazy. Yeah. Well, amazing what people will say when they're behind a computer screen and they don't really. Well, that's true. You know, there are a lot of narcissists and sociopaths out there, and the anonymity of the internet emboldens them. So a lot of this trolling epidemic that's going on are just a lot of these, uh, these individuals that are, you know, they have those personality distortions. Well, I'm going to give you a few opportunities to, you know, make your public claims. And then um, I'm excited about what's coming in the next few months. And once this is all behind us and we can just really focus on this book coming out and all mm -hmm. this other fun stuff. So yeah, an ancient name, I was recently on ancient yeah Island. tell us about that experience that was oh, a great episode oh it was it was cool um it was they, they found a mansion somewhere here in dallas by smu um i uh, drove out there with my assistant at the time and um we did the interview it went real smooth real well uh the producer was uh he was funny laid back it was it, i mean it was a very relaxed environment cool well congrats on that that was really really cool to see you on ancient aliens thank you Okay, so uh, I broke this into a few sections. I did a lot of research into the allegations and compartmentalized the interview so that we can kind of attack the attacks together. So uh, the first section- and, and these are viewer questions? These are not, well, okay. So it was really hard when we made the public statement that we were gonna be doing this interview because you wanted to address people's questions and the allegations that were coming out right. against you. Uh, we opened it up to have people send me questions to my email, the divine frequency at gmail.com. And I received over 200 emails and they were questions. Uh, I mean, everyone was saying that they support you and they were, you know, excited to have questions for you. And none of them had anything to do with the allegations. I, I had two questions come in that had anything to do with the allegations. One about the blue avian hand signal that might be seen as what the Baphomet hand signal is. And then another one that I can't remember, but yeah, um, they were really they, reaching on that one. Yeah. Well, and, they, and it, nothing was rude. Like the, even the people that had a question about the allegations were just saying, hey, I, I do support Corey. And this was my question. Yeah. So, I mean, there were obviously negative things that were being saying said on the YouTube and channel and the Facebook. But oh, yeah, I mean, this is a, you know, love and light community. And it, a lot of us have backgrounds in Christianity. If someone comes up and, and does a major a uh, hit piece that makes someone look like a Satanist, there's a visceral reaction and people pull away. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. That, you know, that happened with Linda Bolton Howell, that happened with a, a bunch of different people. Mm -hmm. But now that they're seeing what has happened, some of them are starting to come back and they're like, okay, you know, that this was obviously, you know, a smear campaign not based in reality. Yes. Yeah, because a lot of the allegations, most of them were made without any research being done on the person, like particularly about me. If they had done any research, they would have seen that, you know, I have a, a journalism. Yeah, yeah, I have a journalism background. Yeah. I have a degree in journalism, and yeah. I also have a Christian background too. Yeah. So. And, and but there's zero journalism in, behind these. I mean, usually what happens is a source will come to a journalist and say, "I have this information," 
they will investigate it a little bit, vet it out, and then go to the person who the information is about and say, I have this information. What is your side of the story? Right. And then put together a real piece of journalistic work. Yeah. That's how it works. How what has been happening is more of the tabloid mm-hmm. kind of journalism. Yes, absolutely. And fake news. Yes. You know. There's been a lot of that actually across the board. It's insane how much of that is out there. Well, what's that. interesting is that uh, the template that you see used out, you know, in, in mainstream, the, the fake news, uh, the uh, armies of trolls and protesters, mm-hmm. uh, hacking, uh, calling people uh, uh, Nazis or uh, racists or Satanists, mm-hmm. it's the exact same template that the mm. deep state is using against the Alliance. That now they're using it in alternative, uh, in, uh, alternative media. What are you talking about that's so important, Corey Good? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> what is it about the secret space program that they do not want me to speak about or Tompkins to speak about? What is it about the Air Force narrative that's coming out that they want to support so heavily and that they have big names in the industry supporting? That's something that people should really look into and think about. Those are the big questions. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let's talk about the little questions really quick. Let's get through the little questions. Yeah. But so to answer your question, I put these together myself. I put these questions. I took allegations. I grouped them and I'm going to give you a chance to respond. So that sounds very much like journalism. (laughs) Well, here we are doing journalism. So um, the first section is going to we're going to talk about why you got into this in the first place. So the allegations are to make money off of it, to destroy secret space program research, and to create a cult. So making it up for money. There was an interview on May 7th uh, with the dark journalist and Bill Ryan, and an hour in, uh, Bill Ryan states that when you came out with your testimony on Cosmic Disclosure that you told David Wilcock a whole swathe of stuff you had never mentioned in your original interview with Christine Anderson. You had also never mentioned this material in the two years prior that you had been posting on the Project Avalon forum. Bill Ryan says it was new material as if it was invented. So can you tell us about what material he's referring to and how would you respond to this? Okay. The prior two years on the forum, I was testing the waters, putting out little bits of information. That's what finally brought Bill Ryan or me to his attention to where him and Christine started to ask me a lot of questions. That's where, and that was at the end of the two years. So I would not have been talking about all of this secret space program stuff before I came out. So that doesn't make sense. Now, I spoke with Christine in a conversation to where it was the first time I was talking about it. I was overcoming uh, entity attachments and all these other things that were trying to keep me from being able to talk about it beforehand. If I tried to talk about it, I'd go into an anxiety attack or I would start stammering really bad. It was, it was really weird. But, you know, after I used the name of Jesus Christ to rid entity attachments, I was able to talk about it for the first time. And then that's a conversation that uh, Christine Anderson captured. And then we did uh, a second uh, interview that wasn't very long that uh, was over Skype that was pretty poor audio quality. Um, that, uh, you know, I mentioned a little bit more in, but I did not have the opportunity to tell the rest of my story before, uh, you know, Bill Ryan had a big problem with me and turned on me over a silly disagreement between belief systems. You know, he didn't like me using the name of Jesus. He wanted that taken out of the uh, audio. Uh, He had this huge argument uh, based on Scientology about uh, what really occurs with entity attachments. I disagreed with him. And it just really kind of went haywire from there. Can you explain a little bit about entity attachments and what that is? Yes, through through different behaviors in life. You can get them through sexual contact. You can get them through, um, you know, negative contact with relatives that have entity attachments that have sociopath kind of tendencies. Uh, these entities anchor to trauma usually. And um, what I was able to do was identify them through a remote viewing session that they were there. I didn't know they were there before. And uh, there was one main one that called itself the gatekeeper. And 
I had, I thought I had gotten rid of it before, but I hadn't. And uh, Stacy said, why don't you use the name of Jesus? And I was like, hmm. I was a pre-ministry major, uh, raised by basically a minister. Uh, why didn't I think of that? You know, so um, I did. I started uh, calling out in the name of Jesus to rid me of uh, these attachments, and I started seeing them flying out. So do you see them through your third eye, or do you uh, feel was, them? Or This was a physical, I was sitting there, and I was seeing, uh, like, shadows, uh, wispy shadows leaving me, just, you know, leaving. So you could see them with your physical eyes? Yes. Could Stacy see them? I was by myself. You were by yourself when that happened? I was okay. back in the bedroom. Uh, you know, going through like a prayer and intercession kind of thing, wow. really trying to get rid of them because, you know, I I was trying to talk about this information and I, I couldn't. So you finally had more of a chance to talk about the whole breadth of the story when you were working with David Wilcox yes. on Cosmic Disclosure. Right. And a lot of this information, you know, as I've stated openly, I was only wanting to provide researchers in the background. I did not want to be public. I'm a major introvert. Um, Getting in front of cameras or people is not my thing. Um, So, you know, I was providing David Wilcock with information, um, you know, Bill Ryan with some. uh, Things were starting to get sour there. And I reached out to Carrie Cassidy. And I told her that I would love to give her information in the background that she could use to vet out, you know, her real sources. And that's the process where I became outed. I had the Skype logs. I was speaking with Carrie Cassidy, and uh, on three different occasions, she asked me, when do you want to do an interview? Let's do an interview, interview, interview. And uh, I said, no. I said, I, it's a security risk for me. I can't do it. I will only do this anonymously. And after the third time of me saying no, she got frustrated and uh, did an article on her website, uh, Project Camelot, uh, with my name listed all in it, and then she did a video. I think my name was in there like six times. I was upset. I uh, contacted Google YouTube support. I forwarded all of the Skype conversations where I said I did not want my name used. I wanted to be anonymous, and uh, they pretty much forced her to uh, pull down pull down that uh, video. Okay, so you had a lot of information at this point of memories of everything you went through in the 20 and back that you had not had a chance to get out into the public eye. So when you decided to go on cosmic disclosure with David Wilcock, how did you guys set up? Cause it took seasons to get all that information out. I've watched almost all the episodes. So what did that plan look like? Well, originally, um, Gaia, they wanted me to come in. They've been looking for a good insider. And uh, they've been asking different people, you know, we want to do a show that's really hard-heading and covers disclosure. Uh, I had been talking with David, and David was trying, you know, he was like, listen, everybody knows who you are now after, you know, Carrie put your name out. Uh, you might as well come out to, to Gaia with me and talk with them, because they'd like to, you know, maybe do 10 episodes. So I sat down, and we, I, I had no idea what I was walking into. I, I walked into Gaia. They brought me into a room pretty much right away to where Jay Widener was in there. I didn't know who he was at the time. And there were two other people that I believe that were sitting there that are really well versed in everything ufology. And they grilled me and grilled me. And it was not in that one sitting, obviously, but it was over about, it was about 40 hours of them like really trying to trick me. And, you know, Jay Widener, when he was sitting across the table, was just sitting there going, you know, was looking at me, you know, this look he has of, I don't know whether to believe this guy or not. But by the end of the um, process, he had his jaw open. And uh, they said, okay, let's do 10 episodes. And we went, and I think we were in the middle of shooting those 10 episodes at, at, uh, to where I was approached by the, the upper brass. And they were saying, it sounds like you've got a lot more information you can talk about. How would you like to do 50 episodes? So I agreed, and uh, the rest is, I guess, history. So you planned out the first 10 episodes where you're like, okay, I'll touch on the basis of all of this stuff. And then when they were asking you more questions, you were probably having more conversations with them it off was, air. It was in the interview process where they were vetting okay. me that they realized how much information I really did have. Okay. And that was when they were kind of formulating their heads, okay, uh, 10 episodes is great, but 
you know, there's a lot more information. When did you know that Jay Widener believed you? Was there anything particular? It was probably after we had been shooting for some time. And um, often I, I would say things and I would hear, you know, Jay, you know, holy crap, you know, and he'd come in and say, wait, wait, wait. And he would like say, that corresponds with this and this that I've heard from so-and-so like 10 years ago that I never told anyone about. Oh, that's cool. You know, and so all these things started happening. And, you know, Jay was like, dude, this guy's either the best actor in the whole world, white world, or, you know, he's telling the truth because right. you know, Jay has studied a lot about body language and all that stuff. Yeah, I guess I should, should <laughs> fix that question. Not when did you know Jay Weiner believed yeah. you, but when yeah. did you feel like, I yeah. guess. Jay, yeah. Jay is, uh, he's, a, he's a, uh, a very sharp cookie, you know, so, but he, he knows a lot about body language and all that. And I just, I felt him dissecting me, you know, but, uh, you know, he had a lot writing on it. You yeah, know, his, his reputation. So he wanted to make darn sure that you know I wasn't going to get out there and make a fool out of it. Right. So as you as they extended that to fifty episodes, then like how did you how do you actually make the plans? So do you sit down with David Wilcock and you guys kind of bracket out what the season's yeah. going to look like? Uh, or interestingly enough, we um, we shot twenty five episodes in one week one time because. Some of the people there were afraid that I was going to get knocked off. I wanted to get as much of the information in as possible. How did that make you feel? I mean, it, <laughs> I, I totally understood that they, you know, but, you know, there, there were serious threats, you know. During that time period, I had a pistol within three to five feet of me at all times, you know. And it didn't help when, like, people came and started harassing us at our home, you know, from Project Avalon. You know, that's what caused us to have to move. So, yeah, there was a lot of that stuff going on. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you know, they, they, you know, we shot 25 episodes in one week. You know, I'm wearing wow. the same shirt. Yeah. But, no, what would happen is we would sit down and we would, uh, Jay would say, okay, um, I think we would like to talk about some of this kind of stuff. Uh, and then uh, David Wilcock has been doing this for so long. He, he'll, he, he just, like this, and be like, okay, I know how to do it. And they're like, okay. And then we just sit back and David starts the show. That's awesome. Yeah. None, none of it ever has been outlined. None of it has ever been laid out on paper beforehand. It's always been, uh, some of the updates I'll provide like bullet points about what I'm going to talk about to okay. make sure that I get it all in. You know? Interesting. But uh, no, it's all improv. And David Wilcock is such a good interviewer because when I, I really respect him as a journalist. And He's probably one of the sharpest people out there in the industry. You, he definitely knows his stuff. And I, w I loved watching, like when I first started watching in the beginning when it all was coming out, he would ask questions that I, that was exactly where my brain was going, that mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you. And he just really, I think, helped the conversation along really well. And in the beginning, you could tell that you were shy and you're trying to get kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I was for? petrified. <laughs> I was scared. Not just of the cameras, but of what was going to happen because of what I was saying. That, that makes sense. I was, you could tell you were trying to get oriented in your surroundings, but yeah. as time passed, you could tell you were definitely starting to get more comfortable with yeah. public speaking. Yeah, that is, yeah, getting used to public speaking, being in front of that black hole that looks like a camera <laughs> was very hard for me. But then I started going through quite a bit of a uh, physical and spiritual metamorphosis as well. That was apparent. You could definitely see yeah. the changes. So, um, okay. So then we have May 7th interview, one hour in, Bill Ryan says, in terms of an argument that an attorney might make in court, let's look at it that way. You could say, look, this person here, whose case we are trying, there is every financial motivation for them to solve their financial problems on behalf of their family and children by taking advantage of an opportunity to go on television to be paid reasonably good money for that and to keep that going for as long as possible by any means possible because which bloody American doesn't feel themselves that they have a duty to provide for their family? We can't criticize that. Here's the motivation for somebody to take advantage of this opportunity that has been presented to them and just pick that bull uh, pick up that ball and run with it as fast as they can because they're getting paid. What is your response? Well, my response is that I do have a family that I have to feed. That if my request to remain anonymous would have uh, been honored, that none of you would even see me to today. I would be still working in the IT industry and supporting my family well. Uh, 
at the time I was having some major difficulties. I'd gotten hurt on the job uh, when I first started. I had to have uh, bilateral bicep and rotator cuff surgery. I had to have surgery on a nerve here because uh, I was putting a server, an 80 pound server into a server rack by myself, which you're not supposed to do. And uh, as I was trying to leverage it up, it started to fall and I went to catch it and it jacked me up really bad. So yes, I was having some financial issues during that time period because workman's comp pays, in Texas anyway, pays like very minuscule, you know, and it was, you know, it, it was really a, a rough time. Now, as far as all of this money I'm supposedly making, uh, uh, because of contract reasons, I can't discuss all of the details, but I make most of my money through blueavians.com. Uh, it's the affiliate program. Uh, anyone that signs up through blueavians.com, I get a dollar a month for them. And people will come in, they will binge watch a month or two and then drop their uh, memberships, but some of them will stay on long term. So that's anywhere between 2400 and like, I think the most it ever was, was like 3600 one month. And then it, boom, it dropped right after. Other than that, I just get, I can't say specifically, but hundreds of dollars per episode that I do. And a lot of that money ends up going for expenses for me having to go all the way up to to Gaia. They pay for some, but a lot they don't. Okay. That money I use, yes, to support my family. This house that we moved into, prior to the house we moved in before was a house we could really afford, around $1,700 a month. Um, some unpleasantness happened at that location, and uh, some people reached out, very generously paid for us a year in this house. And this house is uh, $2,500 a month. After the first year, it was a two-year lease. We didn't realize that was signed. Um, after the, the year, we were responsible for paying it. And if I'm getting $2,400 a month to $3,000 approximately from uh, the affiliate program, that's enough to pay rent and have just a little bit money left over. So yes, I have to find ways to, to, to make, that's, that's not a lot of money. You know, that's, that's not the, the big money that people think that I'm making. Now, you know, uh, I have to make my money at conferences and in, in other ways. So people that want to criticize me um, for finding a way to support my family, I, I really just, it, it, it's, it's an argument that I really can't process. You know, there's a lot of shaming that goes on in this community if you make any money in the process. But most of the people shaming you are making money from what they're doing. Right. At, but they're making a very little bit amount of money and they perceive that since you're on TV, you're making a lot of money. So that, that perception gets. I, I think that the follow-up question though, and the underlying message that I think people are really trying to get at with that question isn't because yes, I agree with that. I think a follow-up though is you have a testimony, something happened to you that you have been talking about, right? And you are on a TV show that is a continuous TV show, right? So once you tell your testimony, you the, people say, "Oh, well, he's just making things up so that the show can continue on." Well, no, they, there was a pro an issue because uh, the show was wildly successful. You know, we're talking like a couple hundred thousand people a week watching it. You know, that's way more than CNN. Um, so you know, we got to the end of my testimony. Of, of all of the information I had to say. After that, basically, I have updates every once in a while. That's when we really started to interview other people that corroborate the information. And, you know, here uh, on, on a lot of the upcoming episodes, they're just going to see David interviewing people without me because I have other projects that I'm working on. And uh, they're, we're in talks with Gaia right now about, you know, doing another show to where I go through by myself, just me and the camera, and talk about everything that I talked about on Cosmic Disclosure, but in more detail. And uh, we're thinking about, uh, you know, calling it uh, Above Cosmic. You know? I like that. I think that would be really cool. I remember when you ta started talking about that because I would be really interested in going through again, because I feel like, uh, you, you know, you got into the public eye, you started talking about this, and now it's 
a little bit more refined, right? You've talked about it a lot more. You can hear what people are interested in and you've mm-hmm. had these conversations back and forth. You've gotten a flood of questions over the last couple of years that now sure. I imagine if you were to go back and readdress your story, you would have it more hammered down. It's sort of like when you yeah. teach, right. you're going to, you're going to gain, like I, I was a teacher, you, you gain a lot from teaching and you right. can teach it better so that I would love to watch a show like that. That'd yeah. Be really cool. Yeah. It's, uh, hasn't been greenlit. It's just, and I yeah, do. yeah, it's, it's, we're going to, uh, we're talking about shooting a pilot and to see how it goes. It's not anything in stone. So, um, but you know, it, it, also we got to match that with next year. We're planning basically a world tour to promote the book mm-hmm. and, uh, hopefully promote, you know, to promote Gaia, uh, Gaia, uh, um, this month, I believe, uh, now is, uh, publishing their, all of their information in Spanish on Gaia and next they're going to do Portuguese. So that's going to open up a, a lot of area for touring and, and promoting. So what the information that you just shared, I think is a very important piece and gives uh, transparency into this concept that yes, you have a testimony, you're sharing that testimony, you've shared that testimony. Now you want to go and you want to expand that out by making that testimony available across multiple platforms, be it through a comic book or a TV show right. or touring the world and sharing that testimony. Right. And, and in the process, I've gathered a lot of volunteers that are talented and, and well-placed in the industry. And, um, you know, these people want to work for disclosure. They want to bring this information out. So we're trying to form a situation to where they don't have to work for these other places, they can we, they can work on this full time, mm-hmm. be paid, and be able to support their families, but still working for the cause full time. So uh, you know, there's a lot of criticism going out about you know us commercializing disclosure, but you know, the way things have been done in the last seventy years haven't worked. You know, just talking to people that have nuts and bolts information, it hasn't gotten us anywhere. You know, it's it's a very important part of the overall message that we need to get to the overall public. So, you know, information like what I'm delivering isn't hurting the secret space program narrative. It's assisting it. It's bringing more interest to it. And that's not only bringing more interest to my story, but to other people's work, the nuts and bolts people that feel like they're being ignored right now. Uh, it's, it's bringing more uh, uh, energy and attention to, to their work as well. So this is something that we should all be working together on to try to get the wider public interested in this subject, as well as making them realize, hey, you know, there are technologies out there that could change my life and then demand it. That's the only way it's going to come out. Yeah. Great answer. So let's do this. Let's talk about this allegation that this is just a marketing campaign to destroy secret space program research. That's exactly what you were just talking about. You might not even need to answer this because you might have just answered it. Um, let's see. May 25th, an interview with dark journalist and Bill Ryan. Disneyfication of the, I like that word, <laughs> of the secret space program is crucial to the marketing campaign effort to attract millennials and young adults. This is clearly an attempt to co-opt important research subjects and to take investigative research to this black into this black project and replace it with fantasy narratives with Corey's kids spreading his blue avian talking points and gearing up for the next phase of targeting the key demographic of teens. Wow. So yes, we are. There's three year marketing campaign. I have no idea where they came up with. Um, I think they may have, uh, the update that I gave where Tyrair said within the next three years, us as a mass consciousness will be making our decision on what type of reality we want to live in. Yes. And that we had that short period to, uh, to be able to obtain uh, the optimal temporal reality. I think he took that and just like he did everything else, he took information and just pushed it together as hard as he could to make something out of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have never had any type of marketing campaign that we've written or talked about and put out. What we have talked about is that all of the vanguard, the older people in the uf- ufology, are they've pretty much done almost everything they can do. 
you know, uh, they're, they're only reaching people, you know, 35 to, you know, 80 years old. They're, they're, they're not interesting to the younger generation. So the younger generation is not getting this information as readily. So what you have to do, I mean, the younger generation is an entertain me generation. Older generation, are just, just show me the information. Right. You know, I'll just look at the information. That's all I need. Younger generation, you know, we've got short attention spans. You get to get the information to them in an entertaining way. So, yes, we've decided that millennials need to be inspired and empowered to work in this industry. And from everything that I've seen, all of the uh, older people that have been in it for a while are very happy to see people like you and Jordan and the younger people coming in with enthusiasm. So I, I, I really don't get the criticism. Well, and there's also a bunch of movies that I've seen and TV shows and things like that where it says it's based on a true story or a true narrative. And if you're really interested in the movie or the TV show, you watch it and then you see that and you want to go back and you want to research that. Yeah. So if you know you have this TV show or this comic book and it says based on the testimony by Corey Good. And people are like, wow, this is a really good piece. This is interesting material. They're going to go back and they're going to research more. And now what are they learning about? They're learning about the secret space program and these technologies. Right. So that's, my two that's the intent. So, okay. Yeah. And it, you know, the whole concept of discrediting the secret space program or the, the real research into it, um, that just really doesn't make sense to me either yeah. because yeah. It's, it's expanding the content. Yeah. There, there are people that have a certain narrative that they want to promote and anything outside of that narrative, uh, they just have to destroy. And, you know, there's also, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on in the community right now with people trying to be divided or uh, manipulated to where they don't accept certain information. Uh, you know, this, this information coming out that's really big about Antarctica has uh, caused a lot of waves. And uh, especially the information about, uh, you know, all the research, uh, illegal research going on, that's what's really freaked out a lot in, uh, in the black op field. So um, the more that I talk about these kinds of things, the harder they're gonna come after. And what illegal research? Uh, well, they have R&D labs there. Uh, they have like Lockheed Martin type companies that have, uh, and I've just been told recently that what I have talked about is just the tip of the iceberg. That's why they're freaking out. There's all types of um, <clears throat> biological, chemical uh, research being done down there, but there's also a lot of technical uh, research and development being done. And, um, so, and, the, and there's a major spaceport down there where they, they are launching uh, to go up in, uh, up to space to service these uh, uh, space stations that they have in this, what I've been calling the lower space program. Mm -hmm. that cool. So um, that information is very sensitive to them. Me talking about the stuff that they're planning on coming out anyway, the stuff about the civilization that they found underneath, is not quite, that's not damaging their narrative. But uh, the R&D labs that are down there, they're against the uh, 1959 or whatever treaty for Antarctica, mm -hmm. that's a pretty big deal. What's the biological and chemical research? Do you know anything about uh, that? Yeah, they're doing all different types of cloning, uh, uh, biological weapons. Everything that is completely illegal to do is being done down in Antarctica. It's a zone that's completely controlled. Yeah, only the military can fly over. Uh, we, what, in our conversation earlier, we just have to kind of imagine what's going on there or rely on reports of scientists. So now I wanted to ask you a question about cults. So the dark journalist in a May 25th interview about seven minutes in, this is a quote. Now the participants in the Corey Good strategy are just young people trying to get involved in something meaningful. They have no idea they are pawns in the three year entertainment game that is meant to harvest the UFO and SSP community financially, emotionally, and even spiritually. At the Contact in the Desert event, strange banners started popping up claiming the next three years as the opportunity to navigate to the most optimal timeline, drawing on Good's theme of raising our consciousness so we will get to UFO disclosure. 
This attempt to co-opt spiritual living memes sets the trap for the seeker to agree with good on these top topics and ignore or go on faith with good's far-flung stories of being a galactic messenger of the blue avian aliens. This technique is also employed by cult leaders to establish rapport and gain trust. So just a really quick thing, Dark Journalist is a YouTuber who has made some videos asking, uh, well, not asking at all, <laughs> making videos, he's made some videos, making some allegations against Corey Good and what he has been doing and claiming. Yeah, so, not based on any research, just hearsay and his own animosity towards me. I would like to see what research he did. Yeah, we would if love any, to yeah, see send the any type of research that you have done. That'd be awesome. So anyway, uh, what's your response to the claim that you're trying to gain trust from the millennial masses to move in as a leader of the blue avian cult? Yeah, I would really like someone to point out what type of activities I've done to create a cult. Every single thing I've done, uh, the whole blue avian message ha has been, we don't need any new religions. Everyone's religion has all of these tenets in it. You know, do unto others as you'll have them do unto you. That's service to up, being service to others. This is not developing a cult meme. A cult tells everyone, I am the, the way and the truth. Only through me can you make it to your ascension or to heaven. And that has not been a part of my narrative from the beginning. My narrative has been that everyone has to use their discernment. Everyone has to go through their own spiritual growth process. We have to deal with our karma. We have to, um, you know, forgive others, which is very hard. But forgiving ourselves for certain things, that's the hardest. Now, these are the tenets of many religions, especially Eastern religions. We're, we are not calling anyone under any one banner or flag. We are calling them to stand up in their own truth, in their own power, to get off of their knees to these elite and stand in their own power because, you know, we're, we're slaves. So any type of uh, information that I've put out about becoming service to other, others, becoming more loving, um, it is not drawing anyone towards any one cult or ideology it's allowing them to use their already established ideologies and belief systems, focus on those positive things, and expand upon them. So what I've researched recently in regard to all of these allegations coming out from the dark journalists and some from Bill Ryan as well, they talk mainly about the marketing for the new material that you're going to be developing. Right. So I think that it has more to do with questioning the... Um, getting the millennials involved, like, I guess maybe speak to the business decision right. to go into yeah. comic they, books and TV shows. You know, trying to call, you know, they're splitting hairs there, you know. Are, are we doing the great sin of uh, trying to commercialize uh, some of this information to get it to the masses, to uh, help the, uh, the population understand that there are hidden technologies? Are we doing that? Or is there something more sinister occurring? You know, you know a tree by its fruits. And the fruits of our labor have been nothing but teaching people to be more service to others, overcoming their own traumas so they can move on spiritually. You know, um, a lot of these nuts and bolts people have problems with the whole ascension message. They believe that it's just a false narrative to give people false hope, just like every other religion. So, you know, it's, it's really hard for me to, to figure out how they see this as being some sort of a cult. Um, now, you know, the business part, yes, we are, you know, we are market, a business markets to a certain demographic. And we're a uh, comic book, that demographic is usually people between, I think it's in their mid-20s and, believe it or not, their 50s. Most of the people that buy comic books are in their late 40s and 50s. Are you the only person? Are you the only person in this, I guess, industry that would that has ever decided to do a comic book with related with relation to topics like the Secret Space Program? No, you know, interestingly enough, um, I think the publisher was Hidden Hand or something strange like that. Um, a uh, comic book was uh, done and agreed to by Bill Ryan, who's attacking me for doing a comic book on Serpo. Um, something that uh, is one of many 
different uh, stories that have come across, you know, Bill's uh, desk that he put out there as truth and then went against and then, you know, his him and hauled on. But uh, yeah, that the Project Serpo was turned into a graphic novel and um, uh, Bill Ryan even wrote the forward to that graph graphic novel. In your opinion, what is the value of a project like that or any project like a comic book? Well, Roger and I have talked about uh, comic books were first developed as propaganda during like World War II time period. That's what they're really developed out. Um, you know, they are covertly using these types of tools to affect the mass consciousness of people. Uh, what we're wanting to do is overtly use these tools against, use the negative tools against them. Uh, you know, like money. Money is a, a negative thing. But you have to have money to continue on a mission. Yeah, it's a, the same goes with, with, with that topic. Okay. So let's talk about a couple of what I'm calling elephants in the room. <clears throat> because as I was doing this research, I had some two really big things come up. So let's talk about the concept of you being blacklisted. This is talked about a lot. Oh, from so, the IT industry? From the IT industry, yeah. yeah. So you mentioned losing your job over your name being publicized. And can you tell us a little bit about how that prevented you from going, you know, staying, remaining that industry in right. that industry and then how that to this day still affects you? If Absolutely. Well, um, even more now that I have done a show, it's even more out there. But um, there's a process you go through when you hire on with any uh, major firm to do IT work. They, they do a background search, a social media search, and a Google search on you. If you ping as being a person that talks with aliens, says they've been to outer space, or talks to eight foot tall blue birds, they are not letting you anywhere near their billion dollar date. They're just not. Um, true, I could go back and get a job doing like help desk work, making like, you know, 16, 18 bucks an hour, like how I first started over 20 years ago. But, uh, you know, that, that's going to put me working, you know, again, like 45, 50 hours a week and have no time to uh, get this information out. Gotcha. So even working like freelance, you're just thinking wouldn't be... No, and that's what I did a lot. You know, people, you know, uh, talk a lot about, you know, Corey did, didn't, was not in the IT field. Uh, then Dr. Sala did some actual journal, journalism and found, showed that I would, did work in the IT field. And then they're picking at other things. You know, I, I worked in the IT field for 20 years, and at the end of 20 years, just about everyone, if they have the certifications and the experience, which you do after 20 years, you start making in the six-figure range. So a long time ago, when I was, I, I did a lot of contracting, and I would, uh, one time I re, uh, accidentally, instead of my check, I received the bill that they were sending to where I was working, the, the contracting firm. And I saw they were paying me, I think at the time I was getting paid like $32 an hour, but they were charging like 80 bucks an hour for me. So I figured, why not cut out the middleman? So I started doing contract work and I would charge anywhere from 65, 90 to even 120 bucks an hour sometimes. I had other people in the industry that did different things because I specialized. I didn't have a wide super range, you know, I didn't know Linux and I didn't know all these other things, but I pooled with other professionals and we worked together. So, you know, I, I did have a lucrative uh, um, career in the IT field. It would be even stronger right now if I was still in, because I was at the point where I was really, you know, starting to make good money and being able to provide for my family. And you have a bachelor's degree in religion and... I did not finish. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah I was a religion uh, major psychology minor at Southern Nazarene University. I was actually going into the ministry, uh, trying to follow my grandfather's footsteps. So, you know, um, I left my third year there, met Stacy, and we left school. I became kind of disillusioned. Um, I was in class a lot of the times. Uh, the professor would be talking, and the kids were sitting there writing it down, and I'd be like, wait a minute. And I'd raise my hand and I'd ask a question that would embarrass him because he would have to explain it. And a lot of times he couldn't explain, you know, different things about religion and, and how it's applied in the church and all that. Finally, 
the doctrine of holiness professor and another professor pulled me into their office and um, they said, do you see those two books? And I looked up and it was a Nazarene handbook and the Holy Bible. And they said, do you or do you not believe that through, only through those two books can you get to heaven? And I said, absolutely not. And they told me, you know, um, you are not cut out to, you know, be a Nazarene minister. You know, we're dropping you from the uh, uh, religion major group. You know, you can find another major. So after that, I was pretty disillusioned, and uh, you know, we uh, moved to Dallas, got married, and um, I we went to church, you know, fairly often up until you know a couple years ago. And how did you get into IT after that? Yeah, uh, after after I didn't know what I was going to do after I left school, and um, I didn't even know how to type. I had uh, one of our roommates. I uh, had one of these old box Macintoshes. They had a typing program that taught you how to type. <laughs> so um, I learned how to type off of that. And I didn't know anything about computers. So one of our good friends came over, uh, took a computer apart, told me all about it, had, helped me put it back together, and started teaching me from the ground up. And then uh, I studied, went and got my A-plus certification, which is an industry standard certification, for mainly hardware. Um, I received that certification and I, and I was working at Stream International doing help desk stuff. I like didn't know anything about computers. So I went through that whole process of, uh, you know, I, I self-taught myself, got my uh, MCSE, Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer certification. And uh, I got that certification. Everyone that had that certification was making big bucks. And I got the certification right when they started outsourcing all of our jobs to India. You know, so uh, people see me. Uh, I was in an article to where I I was protesting my job being sent to India. So that's that's out there. People brought that up as well. Okay. But uh, yeah, I worked my way up after, uh, through uh, 20 years uh, doing a lot of contracting, going like three months here, six months there, doing uh, you know jobs, and that exposed me to a lot of different environments and a lot of different uh, technologies uh, within uh, uh, Microsoft networking. Okay. Uh, and and uh, Citrix and VMware. Okay, great. So I worked for a company that was created by Citrix, actually. Oh, yeah, which one? Appfolio. Oh, okay, I'm not familiar with it. Uh, it's an accounting software. Oh, okay. Like ADP kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay, so elephant in the room number two. Ready for it? <clears throat> this, is, this is what I was thinking. This is just my thoughts. So you were outed into the public eye and then criticized for going into the public eye with your story. By the same people. So what's up with that? Doesn't make sense. There, there's so much hypocrisy in all of these attacks, you know, like with the comic book, you know, I mean, the hypocrisy, if we lined it all up, would be, you know, pretty amazing. You know, I've been... You know, most of these people are accusing me of stuff that they're allegedly doing, which is human nature. How did that make you feel, though, when that started to come out about you being criticized for being in the public eye by the same people that outed you? Like, how did that? It, well, those, pe they're, they're, those people are such a noisy, they're just a noisy minority of, the most, of most of the people out there that are listening to this information. So I, I treated it that way. You know, David Wilcock gave me the uh, advice to, you know, ignore it, ignore it. Uh, in 2015, there were these huge forum wars to where uh, Bill Ryan's first attempt to come out, and um, I think his ex-wife told me he's obsessed with you and he's going to destroy you if it's the last thing he does or something like that. Um, that was like two years ago. Huh. So, um, yeah, there, that, there was that big 2015 attempt to discredit me and bring me down. And uh, this is just the latest one. And, and every single person that has uh, attacked me, just about every single one of them have a membership on Project Avalon. We could do a nice little chart. Uh, any of the others are people that Project Avalon members have gaslit to uh, get upset and jump on the bandwagon. It all, all roads lead back to Bill Ryan and Project Avalon which he's been using as a group to gain stock me for some time. 
but especially over the last month or so, um, him and the dark journalists and a few others have coordinated. It's a huge coordinated attack. Uh, they try to say it's not coordinated. It's an organic movement to, for truth, you know. Right. But uh, uh, I've seen emails, all types of collusion going on about how they're going to assassinate my brand, how they're going to destroy any business uh, I have. Um, they were real triggered about the ancient aliens appearance. They said, uh, you know, some of these emails were people talking about uh, they wanted it after people see him ancient aliens and they Google him, uh, you know, they want to put out information to where bad information pops up. Mm -hmm. So there was there were all these plans. And I, I was hearing a lot of this before Contact in the Desert. So that's why I was so paranoid. Yeah. I was incredibly paranoid at Contact in the Desert. I didn't know. And we had people that we thought were somewhat close to us that were turning on us. So then it makes you a little leery of the people that you already have concerns about. Well, and it's interesting too seeing because this is all sort. Of, some of this stuff is very new to me. With the I mean, with the Corey's kids thing that was created by the dark journalist and he would never say any of our names without first saying Corey's kid Teresa Yanaris and so it was it was this hitting you over the head with the same thing repetition so that it would catch right. and people it's funny now because That's what people, the Nazis would do is the big lie theory you repeat a big lie enough and only that big lie then the pe masses start to believe it. and people think now some people actually think we created that term they're saying oh you're you're part of Corey's kids crew. I'm like, no, 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 no. We didn't create that no, term. That, <laughs> that is not our term. Yeah. It was invented by this uh, person, uh, the dark journalist right. who has a marketing background. He accuses us of being a uh, uh, cult, trying to bring a cult together, but he's like had articles in his magazine about cult marketing cult specifically. Mar yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's, uh, it's very obvious uh, to most of us, you know, what he's been doing, you know, he, uh, you know, gets on the camera and you know, talks all snidely and, you know, it's, it's just a very weird energy. And that's something I've been noticing is that people with these high energy uh, influxes and changes, what I've been saying all along, the good are becoming better, the bad are becoming worse, and the crazier are becoming crazier. It's really happening. We're seeing it before our eyes. And um, a lot of people that, uh, deal with a lot of traumas or have a lot of negative polarity issues they're dealing with, they're being pulled in that direction by these energies. They're revealing, everyone's revealing themselves. They're being pulled over to, you know, places like Project Avalon. Um, people that are service to others and really wanting to um, make this reality a better place for all of us um, are gravitating towards the positive me message and trying to be service to others and help people instead of tearing them down. There's this whole concept that you, know, you have creators and then you have destroyers and you can be focused on creating goodness and putting good, good content and uh, a good message out into the world and you're aligning yourself with energies that are going to help you do that even right. more and then or you can align yourself with destruction and instead and it's, to me it seems sort of like a waste of good energy where it's like you, you know you have a soul contract you're here for a reason and is that reason really to just to you know like the energies with associated with the destruction of other people's creations just sitting there saying oh well this creation's a bad creation or just being crit yeah. critiquing and it and it's and it's really all out of either jealousy or people their their truth we've been hearing that so people you know telling these complete lies and fabrications and saying i'm telling you my truth you know something that's interesting too is that it's like you haven't even had a chance to put these projects out into the world yet like you announced these projects yeah, and then it was just like Wah, take this yeah. it's like can we just, uh, my first initial who, reaction. Who knows if they will fail or even work? <laughs> yeah. Give it a chance to yeah. sink or swim. Yeah. yeah, that was my very first thought. I'm thinking, well, wow, that's kind of crazy to me because you haven't even had a chance to publish the book, to get the comic book out there, to get you know, any of this stuff. It's it's all brand new. You announce and you're excited about it. Right. And instead of people saying, okay, well, even if they're against you or don't agree with you or believe your story, they could just say, okay, well, and then move on with their projects or whatever they're doing to, right. to create and add into this collective instead of spending all their time. And that's what makes me think that it is a, a coordinated attack. Oh, it is. Yeah. Well, you know, and there are a lot of people that are, they've rationalized a lot of really dark behavior. Um, a lot of people in the light community that, there's a few that have been spreading 
vicious, horrible lies and rumors about Stacy and I, uh, our personal life, that there's a, it's really, uh, you know, it's upset my wife, my daughter, and me. It's, it's really bad. But these people are, call themselves light workers. <clears throat> So light, some of these people that call themselves light workers are rationalizing a lot of dark behavior. I've also talked to some of the people that are rationalizing, that call themselves truthers, but are rationalizing telling lies about me. And when I ask them, you know, how is it that you can knowingly go out and spread disinfo about me and call this some sort of fight for the truth? And some of them have actually told me that it is authorized because since they believe I'm a liar, and since they believe that my information is hurting people, then therefore they are authorized to use the same methods against me. Therefore, since they believe I'm a liar, they are authorized as truthers to lie about me, to discredit me, so that their truth can rise to the top. That's how, what uh, this has actually been for conversations. How is your test? How could your testimony harm people? I, I really don't know. I mean, um, they're, you know, I guess becoming more service to others is, you know, pretty scary to, to some people. But, um, you know, I mean, there, there are people, you know, in this community, there are a lot of people who don't want to talk about it. There are more than you find out in public, a large number of people that have, uh, not just personality distortions, but mental issues. So, you know, that's gonna, that's a part of the equation as well. You know, there's all, and especially if these big major energy changes, they're, um, they're being triggered by these energies and they're acting out and their strange behaviors becoming more evident. Like I, when I think about that, 